The markets are moving. And in particular, we got three big sectors that are blowing up. My man, Greg Gunner, Gunner has been on top of these things. And we want to break it down with today's top trades. We want to talk real fast, crypto, precious metals, and oil. That'll be where we kick this call off. We want to dive into some charts, some tickers, and see where we're going. Because the market, it seems like, Gunner, we are in the middle of a melt up here. So why don't you just kick it off? We'll go full steam into this thing. We've got people on the call. We've got the chat open. The comments are ready. So go ahead. If you've got anything on these three sectors, we want to get into top trades for crypto, precious metals, oil. Gunner, show us some charts. What do you like? And where's this melt up heading? Well, you say we've been in a melt up. I, I That's definitely true. And I think we're just entering a new stage of it right now. Yes, there's going to be some stocks that go lower and there's going to be some uh, some volatility. But right now, Bitcoin's breaking out again. It's very clear what's happening on the charts right here. I just drew these lines before we got on the call today. You can see the flag breakout here. This consolidation, while, yeah, it probably was a little bit painful at the beginning right here when it when it dropped from those uh from those highs of 73k all the way down to 60 62k so you got a ten thousand dollar drop in bitcoin right there in a matter of two weeks or so but now we're we're ratcheting back up we're coming out of that flag right here and it feels like new all-time highs or a foregone conclusion if you look across the markets right now you're seeing tons of revised price targets for Bitcoin. I think that's going to be the norm. Everybody's focused on 100,000. I really can't disagree with that. I feel like that's going to be the next logical step. We have the halving coming up. There's all that hype surrounding it. Bitcoin is dragging everything higher along with it. The meme coins are up. Ethereum is higher. It, it doesn't look exactly the same and it doesn't have the same slope. Um, of the breakout that Bitcoin does, but you can still see here, look, I can get out my little tool here, my little magic lines, and you can see where these little short-term consolidations, pullbacks, drawdowns, whatever you want to call them, you can see where they're, end they're ending right here, and we're breaking out above them. It just feels like next stop for Ethereum is going to be a retest of that $4,000 area, and it's going to blast higher. Going back to Bitcoin, retest of 73 k and blasting higher. There is speculative money coming into these uh, these plays right now. We have a crypto miner trade, which we'll review a little bit later um, on the trading desk that we have on, that we put on yesterday. Everything is falling into place. Crypto is blasting higher. The FOMO is there. This is, this is probably going to be the hottest trade of the week, just because we know that crypto can move. And when it moves, it moves fast. So we got that. On the slower end of things, there's still some amazing action happening in gold. If we look at gold right here, we can see that despite the fact that we spiked over 2200 and retreated back down below there, it's still testing this area again. This huge ramp here higher in March can't go ignored. These are all-time highs right here um, that it was tagging up above 2200. We've never seen those prices before in gold futures, and it feels to me like much like Bitcoin, and again, we're dealing with something a little bit different here that's going to move a little bit slower, but we have the same kind of idea where there is some sort of consolidation happening in gold right here. It's pretty tight as far as I'm concerned. And you can see the more it moves uh, closer to the point of uh, of this triangle right here, the more it's going to have to break one way or the other. And it feels like the foregone conclusion is, it, is it's going to break higher here. So we have sort of two anti-dollar trades right here. Bitcoin, the fast moving speculation, gold, the old standby right here, your yellow rocks, they are going to jet higher. I wouldn't be surprised to see gold really gain some steam here. If we use this as a measuring uh, mechanism right here as like a halfway point, if this flag is half mast, then we're going to go from 2000 to about 2200. So I would say 2400 is going to be the next stop if we can get some momentum here on a breakout above 2200. Uh, again, it just sort of feels like this is where the money is going. We haven't seen um, the interest in silver yet. That hasn't taken off. We haven't seen the interest in the gold miners really, really blast off yet. But gold has overcome all of this. It's even overcome the fact that the dollar has regained some strength into March. And that's where gold pushed higher right there. That's usually an inverse relationship. Usually dollar up, gold down, and vice versa. That hasn't been the case right here. It just goes to show you the underlying strength 
in gold, right? And we just really, we can't ignore these type of moves. Again, I don't think it's gonna be as fast and furious as crypto, obviously, but this is a generational breakout. This could be signaling, signaling something really big. And I think eventually we're gonna get that FOMO trade where we have more people just piling into your gold type plays. And finally, last up on these quick hits right here is energy XLE. Yes, we're pulling back a bit today, but look at how quickly energy has sort of taken this leadership role right here. It looked like it was going to fade into oblivion uh, at the start of the year. That certainly hasn't been the case. We've been talking about this for weeks about how don't sleep on energy. I think there's it's coming to some sort of an inflection point. And if we look at oil, I said the magic number was 80. We've got the smiley face on there. We've broken yeah, we above 80 bucks on crude and we're consolidating and pushing higher right out here. I think $90 crude is a foregone conclusion now, and it's going to move higher into the spring. Energy stocks are going to move higher, and your speculative energy trades are going to boom. Your energy breakouts, which we're already seeing, are going to boom. This is These are the three biggest plays of the week that I'm watching right here, for sure. All right. Well, I'll give you a breather. That was exactly what we wanted. Those are the charts that are melting up. And then I will say for anybody on the call, Gunner has a paid service, the trading desk. This is where we talk top trades on a weekly basis. But you guys have three trades that are in those exact sectors. We might as well break them down. We don't always cover the trades that um, you have open. But right now, we might as well. These are open trades that are already there. You've got one in crypto, one in gold, and one in oil. Um, do you want to go through those tickers and just show where those charts, uh, where they are, what, what you like? Yeah, absolutely. So... I'm going to start with crypto since that's our newest play that we just put on. Um, and Matt, you and I have talked about this. Um, the play is on CleanSpark, which is a crypto miner. Now, there are bearish arguments for crypto miners due to the halving coming up. I don't fully understand them, but I know that folks are saying that these crypto miners aren't going to be able to perform as well. Um, and mining is going to become more difficult after the having less Bitcoin available, something along those lines. Fundamental mad. Am I on the right track with with, with that? Yeah. Matter? And we might as well use this time to uh, you can all thank me later. Right. So I got I told everyone over the last few weeks I was getting out further out of CleanSpark. I was in CleanSpark today. I don't even have to disclose it because I'm not in CleanSpark right now. I wish I was. I think I was indicative of those last little weak hands <laughs> that were, you know, probably maybe within the last seven days, definitely within like last five trading days. That's where I was like, ah, I don't, I don't know if I've, I've got the, you know, got it in here. I think there was a rotation and I was outsmarting myself. Guess what? There's the, 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 the boys are back here with Bitcoin and the, uh, the miners are, are making yeah. moves. So things well, are looking I, good. I love a trade that goes against the grain. And if you have price action moving against what the news is saying, then I feel like you're onto something because people haven't pivoted the consensus opinion for the past several weeks actually going back to you know probably the beginning of the month was that the crypto miners are in trouble and they look sluggish they look pretty bad i mean this is some serious volatility uh that we had in here these are some big big down days down 13 percent right there uh on monday the 11th down 16 percent for the day big ugly bearish engulfing candles and now, in the in the phase two, I will say this because like as someone that got kicked out of this trade, that was when Bitcoin was going up. So there were days where this thing completely yeah. decoupled and shook shook people out, like myself, because you're like, oh man, I know Bitcoin's gonna go higher. I think it is. Why is this trading vehicle not doing the thing? Now all of a sudden we're starting to see like, hey, it, it's catching right back up. Yeah, yeah. And yesterday. I wasn't going into Monday morning thinking I have to buy a crypto miner, but when I saw CleanSpark gap higher, so it gapped higher and it opened above 20 bucks, which is right above. And again, these lines, this is just approximations of like when we're coming out of these consolidation zones. But when I saw it coming out above 20 bucks and then pushing higher on big volume, bigger volume than we'd seen in, a, in several weeks, it felt like this thing was going to blast off and we barely were able to like grab the tiger by the tail before this thing really exploded higher. And now today, even after a 20% move higher yesterday and that close right there to new highs, it did retest down here into the 22 range, but it's blasting higher again. I mean, we're, we're already in the green. It feels like this thing's ready to go on a serious run again. 
I don't know if it's going to stick longer term. I don't know if people are going to be ditching this thing when the having happenings. But what I do know is I can take advantage of this in the short term with with call options. Yes, we're paying a bit of a premium for them, but this seems to be the place to be right here. And it just is winding and getting more volatility to the upside, which is only, you know, helping us make money on our calls on this particular play. Now, yeah. the other crypto miners, you know, there is some, I think there's some some crack ups happening um, in this space because we have Mara, our, our former favorite trading vehicle in this space, which really isn't doing that much. So maybe this is just hot money rolling into certain groups uh, or certain stocks within the group right here because Riot kind of looks the same. Yeah, it's trying to base out right here, but you can see the momentum isn't anywhere near where it is in clean spark. Maybe it's just a yeah. smaller, more volatile, uh, you know, type of move right here, but luckily there's some very liquid options on it. We were able to get a hold of them. These are tough trades. It's not easy to close your eyes and buy something that's moving up like this. Um, so I commend everyone that was able to do this and to, and to, you know, get in on this at the right time. It, you know, that, that, that really says something about, uh, you know, your trading ability. If you can really jump in and say, okay, this is triggering, it's time to buy now. Let's see if we can get that big wave higher. And that's exactly what we got. Yeah. And one last move, one last talk on that before we head into uh, gold, uh, your gold trade that you've got on, is maybe there is something to it. If When you look at Mara and Riot, those were the premier Bitcoin miners to trade over the last two years, two, three yeah. years. That has obviously switched when you look at those charts. And that might be because of the logic that the, the reason I moved from Mara to CleanSpark, whatever it was, a month or two months ago, you start hearing these things of like, after the halving, which miners are the most efficient at like, how much do they have to pay? And what do they, what infrastructure do they have to mine Bitcoins? Can they actually still make money at that halving rate? I think uh, CleanSpark was one that could Whereas the other ones might, it might be up in the air. Like maybe they can't make money. And again, you double check on my research on this, but this is, I'm following narratives that the market seems to be following. So if you're wondering why Mara, Riot, and CleanSpark don't have the same charts, well, the first two have the same charts. The third has a different chart. It might very well be because people are picking up on that narrative that this miner after the halving still has uh, the economics behind its back. So we'll see That's what happens, good. but this thing's moving and you guys you guys pick, picked a winner. That's great fundamental amount of information. Say so you're teaching me something. Um, yeah, we'll, and, you know, we'll we can see. add all that stuff to like kind of our memory bank here and, and when we're figuring out these trades. But again, the narrative of crypto miners stink, crypto is the place to be, you know, when we can turn that on its head and we can follow just a pure price breakout like this, good things happen in the markets. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited about this trade. I certainly hope it continues to wind higher uh, right here. And hopefully we can book some gains, uh, you know, hopefully later this week on on our Clean spark uh, calls. Yeah. Now, some uh, some some gold moves that we're seeing right now have been a little bit slower, obviously, than crypto, and that's just how it goes. You know, um, yes, gold has been very impressive lately. Yes, there have been some false starts. Uh, the main thing I'm looking for here is: Are we going to see the miners finally buy into this whole rally? Uh, a lot of uh, different elements have been holding gold back. I think um, there's been some, I want to say, investor disinterest in gold because there's so many other powerful trends occurring in the marketplace right now. There's so many other places to put your money. Why would you put it in stuffy old gold? Um, you know, and there's some other arguments that like, okay, and Matt, you and I have discussed this at length where possibly the whole gold narrative has been... Uh, has been kind of stolen by the crypto crowd and all of the younger traders aren't aren't involved in gold. Uh, they're involved in crypto instead. Uh, I mean, I think there's a possibility yeah. there, but but again, I think what we're seeing here is also a generational breakout. And I think once something starts to trend higher and that trend starts to stick and it begins to extend and it becomes undeniable, I think you get to the point where traders can't ignore it anymore. And you start seeing some of that hot money flow into the trades that are going to make you money in these groups. So we have this huge gold move, which felt like it came out of nowhere. We've been tracking gold since it was really pushing above that uh, $2,000 monthly close at the end of November. There has been a little bit of volatility, a little bit of consolidation there, but we've been on this thing. And then finally, we get this big impulse move higher to these all-time highs and this teasing of the $2,200 range. However, 
looking at the gold miners, GDX in particular, which we have calls on at the trading desk, you can see how it does not look as clean or as exciting. These stocks have not kept up with gold, and that's because we really haven't spun into this super speculative gold only goes up type of environment that we saw in the previous commodity super cycle back in the aughts. Um, if you remember back, um, you know, before the great financial crisis and even after where once uh, precious metals started ramping up again, these were the trades in the market. Uh, you know, silver was just an absolute riot to play. It just had these huge swings uh, higher and lower. And uh, the miners, you had junior miners popping off left and right. It was a great place to go and put speculative dollars to work. When you have a sector that's been dead for so long, which it has been, I mean, gold has been in a secular bear market up until very recently, then you don't have that type of speculative money flo floating around in the sector, and no one has been involved in the gold miners. The reason why I'm trying to get involved in them now, and the reason why we are involved in them in the trading desk is because it looks like it's coming off of these lows and we're getting a very sloppy consolidation here. But I think we're going to go to $32 or higher because I think it's going to get to the point where this gold trend is undeniable. And even if we don't see the momentum moves to the extremes that we're seeing in crypto, there's still going to be money making opportunities in gold. And I just don't think anyone's really paying attention to it yet. I think it's getting a little bit of attention. I saw, believe it or not, an article on CNBC about how strong gold was uh, late last week, which kind of threw me for a loop. I was like, wow, someone's actually paying attention to this. So it is starting to trickle out there, but I don't think we're at that fever pitch level yet where people are like, oh man, you know what? Gold miners are dirt cheap and they've gone nowhere. Maybe this is a, a, you know, a chance to put some speculative money to the work and see where they take us. I think we need to have some solid closes above 30 bucks and then a push toward 32. And then that's going to be the bigger breakout right there. And you can see this has kind of been, it hasn't been perfect, but you can see where uh, it's been turned back on multiple occasions going back to this, the second quarter of uh, 2023. A break above there might be a change in character. And then also with silver, look at silver. Silver's not at all-time highs. It's nowhere close. You know, you have gold trading at all-time highs and silver's been left behind. If we put the weekly chart up here, look all the way back here uh, at the last commodity bull run where it spiked uh, up toward 50 bucks in 2011. Look at this huge ramp right here from 2008 this is the depths of the financial crisis in November 2008 when silver was at eight bucks. It made it all the way to 50 bucks by uh, by mid-2011. We have not seen anything close to a rally like that in silver. You'll know when it starts happening because it's going to start going crazy. I mean, you can see how steep, and this is a weekly chart, you can see how steep this move was um, when it really broke out and started taking off right there in the third quarter of 2010. And Matt, you remember those days. Yep. I mean, that, that was the place to be. That was the place to be trading right there. And I think it'll happen again. It's just a matter of time. And we can move, we can fast forward here to this and put it back on the daily. But once we get out of this mess right here, silver is going to be the place to be, man. I mean, you're going to see a lot of catch-up trades happening. It's got to get over 26 bucks first. <laughs> but it's looking yep. good. Yeah. And again, putting on the fundamental hat, if we're talking gold miners and GDX, um, you look at any day that we're sitting there above or around that 2200 mark, or it looked like, remember we had that Sunday close at like 2145 or, or not close intraday, like 2145. That looks like it's the new possible support for that little flag. So if that's the case and gold stays at 2150 for the foreseeable future, every day that passes, these gold miners, the, the producers are making ounces every single day. They're just making more money. And at some point in time, you're going to have earnings and they're going to be like, well, we made all this more money and you you got to get some momentum somewhere for those miners. So they're, they're going to perk up at some point in time with gold being where it is. And I don't yeah, see just, gold dropping from where it is. So that just means you know, the miners are going to catch up. And you see like, you know, you have like what, what amounts to like basically like a big, huge, messy wedge here. Um, you know, this big, huge... Uh, I mean, you can call it consolidation, you can call it just sideways uh, chop, but as it gets narrower and narrower, it's going to have to break one way or the other. And everything's pointing to, it's probably going to at least start testing on the upside. And the more that it consolidates and pushes higher in this range without coming down here and retreating back into the 22s, the more eminent a breakout is going to be to the upside. Because all you're seeing there is you're seeing, you're seeing, you know, sellers dry up at higher and higher prices. And so it's just going to keep on spinning. And that's how these breakouts work. And you get to the point where no one's willing to sell at these prices and it just starts shooting higher. 
So it, it feels like this is a long time coming. And I'll take these longer term lines off of here, but you get the idea of kind of what we're looking at here. And again, it's tried, it's tried, it's tried. We, we did get that big spike um, during the, you know, the, the COVID panic right here and gold spike too. This is when gold teased 2000 back in mm -hmm. August, 2020, but haven't seen much of it since then. So needs to get back up there, needs to get back up to 30 bucks and then who knows, but yeah. I feel like the momentum, it's only a matter of time before the momentum really comes back uh, in this group right here. And, and we'll have plenty of shorter term trades start appearing after that. This is just us keeping an eye on kind of the longer term, uh, the, the longer term prospects. But it, it all seems to be setting up bullish as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I wouldn't be trading. I know a ton of people, we get this on all the calls that I'm on. People want to know more about silver when we're talking about gold. But right now, until now, the silver charts have not looked good. So what you're right. doing is I think you're getting a little bit of a guessing game. This is why Gunner and the trade that you guys have on is with GDX. That's a gold miners ETF. It's not with silver. Silver, I think, is still, um, I just tried to look up one of the my like favorite, just sort of like, oh, what, what goal uh, silver miners you have? If you type in the ticker AG, that's first majestic. Um, what, what's the ticker? HG? A, A, G. Yeah, so that's first majestic. Cool. Yeah. Like that chart, like you don't want to be playing. This is just more like uh, learning as traders. You know, yes, if you're buying hold and you're just going to buy it and 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 sit there for for years, then that's fine. Like maybe it, maybe it works out. But I mean, this thing, you don't want to be trading that right now. It's just yeah. there's not much happening unless you're really in tune with some, some short term technical. So, um, well, yeah, I mean, you, and you don't need to and you don't need to like have your CMT to figure this stuff out either. I mean, we're looking at a situation where we have a series of lower highs every time it's failing to get up there and it has not turned the corner yet. So even if you're looking to like buy this longer term, wait until you see this base out and, and begin to turn the corner. You might spend a couple more bucks. You know, you might have to wait till you, to buy this thing in the high sixes instead of buying it in the fives. But at the same time, at least you get your timing a little bit better and you're not going to be sitting through another 18, 24, 36 months of churn waiting for this thing to break out. You know, that's the that's the good stuff about long term technicals and looking at the markets is avoiding the situations where you have these dead money trades where you're just like, I think silver is going to turn around. Just wait, wait and see if it bases out. And if it does, so you paid a higher price, at least it's moving in the right direction. I'd much rather pay a higher price than say I got a steal on a stock that just keeps on going lower. That stinks. I don't want to do that. Yeah. All right. You want to switch gears? Let's talk third, third big uh, breakout that we're seeing. And that's in energy. You guys have a, a an oil trade on. Yeah. And I mean, you can see this daily chart of XLE. We're right back up here in the top of this range. Uh, and again, it's been turned away in the low 90s. How many times? This is... June of uh, 22, during that grinding bear market, energy was the only thing that worked during the first half of the year. And then it decided to not work um, in the third and fourth quarter. And then again, uh, you see here on the, this is the end of the year when it tried to run up again and failed. And then it just took the whole year off in 2023. It didn't do much of anything. This is when all the tech stocks were snapping back. And now after everybody had left this trade in late December, no one wanted anything to do with energy names. It looked like they were just about to fall off a cliff. However, I, if you remember, we were talking about oil. I'll go to the price of oil right here, saying, and Matt, you and I have had this conversation on multiple calls now, talking about how, well, you know, if you look at, if you look at WTI, if you look at like crude, someone's coming in and buying in the high 60s. Buyers are coming in every single time. Um, in these in these high 60s and pushing it higher and you can see it begin to creep higher here toward the end of the year it's starting to steadily build finally we can put our smiley face emoji on this chart because it's broken out um, above this level right here it still has some work to do but i think we're heading into the 90s right there and of course that's going to look really good and the energy stocks are kind of leading the way here um this this chart is really really uh a beauty as far as I'm concerned, because you have a situation where it's tested these low 90s multiple times, and you can see where we have uh, higher low, higher low, higher low, higher low, higher low right here. So again, buyers are coming in and picking up energy shares at higher and higher prices. That's bullish. It feels like we're getting to the point where this is going to be a major breakout. And again, we can sort of 
it's not going to be perfect. We can maneuver this line however we really want to right here. But it feels like once we get into the mid 90s for XLE, we're really going to start to see a lot of these stocks uh, start to take off. And in fact, if you look at some of the big guys um, right here, you can see their charts look even more productive. This is Philip 66 PSX right here. Really clean uptrends beginning to emerge um, in this group right here. We have a speculative trade on. Um, we have uh, an offshore driller, uh, a little a cheapy on in the trading desk in rig right here. Yeah, it's retreating a little bit today along with the rest of the sector. It's a little bit more volatile than the rest of them, but you can see the powerful move off the lows right there. And we really like that break um, uh, above 580 right there. And I think it's going to go into the high sixes before it really starts to rest. Um, you know, today's an off day. It happens. Nice, really nice day yesterday when it was up 4%. Uh, right there. And so even these speculative plays, and this is a, and the reason why we're trading stuff like this is because this thing can move fast and we can get those big momentum moves off of it. You can see the history it has of when it gets going, it really goes uh, back here at the beginning of 2023. It shot from, you know, the fours up into seven. So it almost doubles in a matter of weeks right there. And then you get these long periods of consolidation and it can pop again. I feel like we're in one of those areas here coming off of these lows um, right here, we kind of had this false move lower when, again, no one really wanted anything to do with these stocks. Then all of a sudden, oh, people are buying energy stocks again. And these speculative names like RIG just start shooting off. I think this can go a lot higher very, very quickly, um, you know, and treat us to some really quick gains. Yeah. And that's the other thing that we like. I mean, I know we've got a lot of people on the call on top trades with their in the trading desk that are your paid readership. And that's why, I mean, we, we, we pay you the big bucks in the sense that you're looking at hundreds of charts a day. And something like rig, it might not fit in most people's radar. And all of a sudden you're finding this nice, really cheap stock, very optionable, doing what you want it to do in an, in an uptrending oil market. Um, so it, that's a good looking one, even if we've got a pullback um, today. So, all right, well, there we have it. Gunnar, any, um, anything else we want to wrap up on those big melt up sectors? Because, I mean, we're seeing all those things. They're starting to pop off. Uh, um, I mean, yeah, it just, again, like, I, I think there's going to be volatility, especially in crypto, obviously that's, and, you know, it even applies to something like the rig trade, you know, when you're, when you're involved in these volatile names and these volatile areas of the market, you're going to have these whipsaw moves. You're going to have those fearful moments and you just have to like be able to emotionally regulate and get yourself through some of these trades right here. It looked like, you know, that we could have moved lower here. Uh, when Bitcoin topped out in the 73, 74K range, just due to all these extreme moves we were getting um, just last week uh, on the 19th, we had a move that was like, this was like what? This is one of Bitcoin's worst days percentage wise um, in a couple of years, I think, where it dropped from 67 all the way down to 61. And then the next day, it just, it had one of its best, it had one of its best days in the past couple of years. It just rockets back up. That's the nature of the beast right here. So you have to kind of understand that and sort of like, you know, get your mind right going into these type of plays right here and know that like, okay, they're going to be volatile. But when you have these nice breakouts and they get out of those choppy consolidation zones, that's when you can really grab onto it and harness that volatility in your favor because all this mess gets taken out of it and you get these big surges. If you look back here, uh, you know, at the end of February, you get these nice big candles. And then right here, you get a nice clean breakout. It can hesitate in some places. You're going to have some red in there occasionally where it needs to reset. But ultimately, this is where this is the chunks of the chart where the big moves tend to happen. And if you position yourself in enough of these plays, then you're going to have more winners than losers. You're going to be doing a great job uh, in these markets. Yeah. Um, Gunnar, if you let me, if you stop sharing and let me share for a second, we've got, I see some comments um, and we can talk about some of the tickers. Again, this is this is one of those things you just kind of see these things on the internet. So don't don't trust this with like your life. Um, this is just something that got sent around in the halls of uh, uh, Paradigm Press or whatever. But these are some of the the biggest corporate holders of Bitcoin. So you're wondering who just sits there and holds Bitcoin because obviously if Bitcoin goes to 100k or or further. Besides the miners, you just have people that aren't mining at all that just hold it. Obviously, the big one is MicroStrategy. It's MSTR. Right. Um, this doesn't have tickers on it, so maybe take a screenshot. But you can see it's like Galaxy, Marathon, Tesla, Coinbase. So they just hold Bitcoin. 
So as this goes up, their their assets are just going to be going up. And CleanSpark doesn't actually hold that much. Um, so it's a they, tiny little company. It's not that big. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, something to look at there as well. Um, and and something that you guys can keep track of because if if we start going ballistic, obviously micro strategy has already been going up, but um, there's yeah. going to be some other other names on that list. All right. So Gunner, we've got a lot of stuff moving. What um there was uh we had an IPO last week that you were talking about in the green room earlier. Our friends at Reddit, do you want to cover yeah. that one? Yeah, that one's been crazy. And I think again, like, um, and uh, disclaimer, I haven't looked at the chart today, so this will be fun for all of us. I think it's RDDT, right? Um, look at look at this thing. I mean, this yeah, is go a, ahead and analyze that. You, you do a very classic anal analyzation of that chart. Well, I would say there's not a lot of price history. How about that for an analysis? But um, recently, a lot of IPOs have put in uh, what we call in the business like an IPO base, which is um, generally what happens with IPOs is there's a ton of hype when they first come on the market and they ramp higher that first day when everybody piles in and then they sort of fade and they start going lower and then they lose the opening prices. Like right here, the opening price was like, close to $47 for the Reddit IPO. So you'd have a situation where on the first day you get these huge candles where everybody tries to pile in on all the hype. And then the next day they start selling. And by the third or fourth day, it's below that price. And then the thing just sort of leaks into oblivion for a couple quarters. And then it finally bases out and then it gets moving again. Um, a great example of this is the early days of Facebook when Facebook first became public back in the early uh, 2010s. Um, you know, the first couple of years it was on the market, it really didn't do much. And then it has this moment where it sort of crystallizes with everybody that like, hey, this is going to be a successful company and it begins to rocket higher. That's generally what happens when the market's not super frothy. However, right now, as you can tell by all the other stuff we've been talking about, about crypto, and you know, all the stuff that's been going on with semiconductors and AI, there is a huge risk appetite in the markets right now. And it's been proven by how quickly things are moving higher and how long the fourth quarter melt up from last year has just kept on rolling. I mean, we're almost done. We're done with the first quarter on Friday and April trading begins um, next week after after Easter break. Yeah, so, Friday's closed. The market's not even open. Oh, the market's closed Friday, not Monday. I keep on forgetting that it does that. So yeah, so the market's closed and, and so we're done. This week with March trading, we're done with the first quarter and we were still just stair stepping higher. People are buying Reddit, um, you know, which, you know, there's competing narratives about how well this is going to perform as a public company. But you can see here on the opening day, there was an incredible appetite for it. Yesterday, it was up 30 uh, percent. Today, it's up another 12. I wouldn't be jumping in on this thing because I don't really have anything to trade against here. I mean, I guess you could go in and say, all right, I'm going to buy some shares of this. And if it loses the lows of the day, then I'm out. However, I just feel like it's super volatile intraday. It's not really something I want to be involved with. I like to see some price history in something. I like to see the IPO base. If we want to talk about an IPO base, let's look at Mediterranean Chipotle, aka Kava, um, where you have a much bigger IPO base here. You can see how this IPO um last summer it did rally and then it started to fade it lost its ipo lows right there and then it turned the corner and it broke out um in the high 50s and it's run all the way it's run almost 10 bucks now since that breakout um in early march no i didn't trade this because earnings were kind of in the way and i had some other reasons why i was looking at other stocks and sectors uh, but you can see here this is a more typical ipo base formation that i'd be interested in trading i'd like to see several months of of uh of price history i like to see how the stock trades you know all those things to take into account to sort of get a better feel for like what you're getting into now is kava going to be you know a great stock long term i don't know matt and i were just discussing this yesterday like i don't know what kind of staying power this thing has and it's incredibly expensive right now it's a very trendy stock um but uh you, you can't really deny this uh this price chart right here it's not, it's no chipotle as far as we're concerned yeah, the 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 biggest analysis you can do on it is try and eat kava two or three days in a row for lunch. It's not going to happen. Whereas if you go to Chipotle two or three days in a row, that's called a great week, uh, as opposed to kava, which is I can't take it. I can't take that much. Yeah, it's fine. Like I I I give it a fine. That's my rating of kava. Like I you know we have we have one down the street here. So I mean it's it's, right. it's, it's okay. All right. Why don't we? We're gonna call an audible because the comments are coming in. We got to do it. 
me and Gunner are here in Baltimore. We obviously had some news that happened 1.30 a.m. this morning. We have a container ship blast in to the Francis Scott Key Bridge, the yeah. writer of the Star Spangled Banner. Yeah. Uh, crazy. One, one point for everybody, right? This is just like keeping your eye on big trends and buy and hold, not swing trades. But like there are cameras everywhere, by the way. There's yeah. just like somehow someone just has a video of the ship crashing into the uh, into the uh, bridge and the whole bridge just collapses. And again, I think there's still uh, there's there's people that have been injured, killed. Like it's not a good scenario. Um, but what we're asking here in the comments are what are some knock on effects of this? And I can tell you they're going to be pretty big because that's where the port of Baltimore you know, to get out, that's where, that's where you go through. So I think there's going to be some big knock on effects. Um, we yeah. export a ton of coal out of Baltimore. Probably also also cars. I think the CEO of Ford has already commented on it because there's a, I, I, it's the third busiest port on the East coast and a ton of automobiles come through the port of Baltimore. Um, and so it, I think it depends on there's, you see, there's, yeah. there's so much uncertainty thrust on the market right now. How long is it going to take to clear the mess and reopen the port? You know, because basically right now there's a roadblock right across the entrance to the harbor. That's not that big of a shipping channel right there. Um, so, you know, you have a situation where uh, not only is traffic going to be a major issue, but you can't get boats in and out. I think I was reading earlier this morning that there are 10 container ships now anchored in the Chesapeake Bay because they, they're they stuck. They can't get in. So I don't know if they're going to reroute them or what the plans are going to be. Uh, right now, no. I mean, like John just asked, are there no alternative routes? No, like that's that bridge is you have to go under it to get into the port of Baltimore. It's a it's a yeah. If you let me um let me share my screen. This is gonna be we're gonna go back to like the it's like first grade stuff here. But I'm I pulled up our friends at Google Maps. Um, but right, this is this is Baltimore. This is where the harbor is, and you've got yeah. all kinds. Of, a lot of a lot of stuff is right around here, where this is where the main like loading and where, and where Matt's mouse is, and where Matt's mouse is right now. Those those are both tunnels, ninety five, yeah, eight tunnel, tunnel. tunnels that go under the harbor. So those don't those don't block anything. But you can see where the 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 key bridge is right there. That blocks, and the the harbor is the gray spot just above Dundalk, yeah, right there. So that yeah. is where a lot of this stuff is taking place. And this um, bridge, a good part of it, where, um, how do I do this? I'm going to do some layers. Let's get on this. I mean, you can't, never mind. You can't really see it that well. But a good portion of this is all in the water. Yeah, it's in the water. So, like, it's blocking the whole way. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I guess they're going to have to reroute it. I mean, all that traffic, all the all the vehicle traffic is going to have to go through the two tunnels. No hazmat through the tunnel. So they're going to have to go around, all the way around the beltway, which is already a capacity. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously there's, you know, there's... Uh, there's going to be some issues here. It's just a matter of like how long it's going to take to resolve these things. They're not going to be able to build a new bridge in a month. Um, yeah. but I think that's the least of our issues uh, right right now. Um, I, I really don't, you know, I really can't say like with any certainty, like, oh, this is definitely going to affect, you know, um, these stock, these particular stocks or whatever. I think, I think everything's so fluid at the moment. It's impossible to say like, this is going to be the market effect of yeah. this disaster. But it's definitely oh. interesting and like how I mean, like how something like this happens and how many things have to fail for something like this to happen is just unfathomable to me. You know, even if a boat loses power, how, why is it not in the shipping channel? You know, like, why is it not right there in, in the middle? Why is it off to the side? I, I yeah, I, I, I don't have enough knowledge. Yeah. Uh, you know, and we'll, really the answers might not be there for trading uh, for what what's going to go up and what's going to go down because of this, but we're going to find out a week from now. We're going to know exactly what what went up and what went down. I don't have the info of like there. There's probably some smaller companies that trade out of that port, and all of a sudden, if they get throttled, then that's going to hit their bottom line, and then their uh, uh, their shares are going to be affected. That kind of stuff. It's the same maybe thing. The, with like maybe the big thing that it changes is it Suez Canal. Out gets people talking about inflation again because I, I feel like we're at a tipping point for people starting to talk about it. People stopped talking about inflation for a while because they said, okay, I think we're good. But inflation doesn't move in a straight line up and down. I think it's going to be, it's going to come in waves. And obviously we had major supply shocks due to COVID and all that sorting its way through. But we're definitely in an inflationary environment. There's no denying that. Mm -hmm. And to just and to just declare inflation dead like the mainstream media has been attempting to do is obviously a foolish thing to say at this juncture. And if we look at things like, well, here, I'll share my screen again. Yeah, uh, the the three sectors that we started with, those are all yeah. basically inflation trades. 
I mean, this is the mar this is not narrative speaking. This is the market speaking. And if you look at and if you look at what's happening in the markets, everything is pointing toward the inflation trade being an issue. Obviously, Dr. Copper has retreated from those highs a little bit, as you would expect after such a big move. But it feels like this is a change in character. And that's why I draw these lines on charts. It's not necessarily to pinpoint exactly where these turning points are, but it's to show you that like this downtrend is done. There's something happening here. And $4 is kind of a magic number for copper anyway, which it had been stuck below there for most of 2023. And now it's coming out um, and beginning to break out. It's going to retest here. And I bet you it's going to springboard off of that. You know, you typically have these breakout moves in commodities that kind of overrun and then retrace and then springboard off. Um, it's coming down here to retest that $4 mark right where it uh, was rejected back there last August. And I wouldn't be surprised if this pushed higher and uh, retested, you know, the high 420s at, at some point very soon. And it does feel like this is going to be a change in character um, for copper, which is, you know, which hasn't done well uh, since it peaked uh, in the 480s here uh, back right before the bear market in 2022 right there, you know. And again, inflationary. We can see the inflationary look of copper here from the COVID lows. Look at uh, March 2020 right here when copper was down was beat down to like close to two bucks. This is when everything, all commodities are going to zero right here. Spring, summer, 2020, right? Or below. Next, if you're, if you're oil, you went below zero. Yeah, you went below zero. Uh, but you can see here, you know, the inflationary pressure of COVID right there all the way into 2021. Um, that's a huge move right there. And it feels like whatever this reset was right here, um, Whatever this, you know, the bear market scare in 2022, all of that, it feels like it's over. It feels like we're coming out of that and we're going to start testing these levels again and pushing higher. Again, these are inflationary trades, gold, copper, maybe Bitcoin. I don't know. You know, you, yeah. you can kind of put them in the same bucket, energy. I mean, like this stuff is happening. And instead of like really digging into this, you know, the market is still kind of fixated on a lot of the tech stuff, which is fine. But I think we just need to really like start thinking about it and be prepared while everybody's watching this parabolic semiconductor chart, which is crazy too, might I add, that like this thing hasn't died yet. It's it's amazing. I mean, if you look at this, I mean, yeah, there's been a little bit of pullbacks here, but this is the this is the sector ETF. This is this is SMH. This is I'm I'm not pulling up a chart in the video right here. I mean, we had a huge bearish engulfing candle right here and I said, okay, we're probably gonna have to chop along. No, we haven't retaken those highs yet, but it's done a pretty darn good job of remaining stable so far. So my question for the semis is like, when are we going to get to a point where people start getting spooked and want out of this trade? When are we actually going to see some profit taking? So that's where my mind is on on uh, on those plays, just to shift gears a little bit, because you have your Nvidia's right here. Nvidia looked dead in the water after this huge bearish engulfing candle right here, and it said, nope, just kidding. And now it's right back at these levels. Yeah, it's down a little bit today, but I mean, the strength is undeniable here. Um, SMCI. Um, kind of spooky i put my ghost on this one because it looked like it might break down here it looked like we might have had an island reversal and it said nope and it's pushed yeah. higher ever since then i mean this was up seven percent yesterday uh incredible volatility kind of creeping into these names right here i just wonder how long the, the buyers can keep it up um you know i just i i i would have trouble justifying buying right here and assuming that we were just going to be able to ride this up to 1200 and beyond it, it could it could very well happen uh, I'm not saying it won't happen, but I would have trouble from a risk reward standpoint, you know, uh, saying something like, oh, this is definitely like, this is definitely a solid trade that I should be taking. And this is the best risk reward opportunity in the market right now, because I feel like it's not, I feel like this could be a trap. Um, you know, I want to be, I want to be kind of cautious uh, around some of these plays until we get a uh, better bearing of whether or not they're going to test those new highs or, you know, whether it's just going to totally you know, split apart, which is, I think, I think we're kind of starting to see that uh, right now. If we look at the heat map right here, this is semiconductors over here in this block. And you can see, you know, MU is looking good. AMD is bouncing today, but then you have NVIDIA down, um, ABGO down. So it kind of a mixed bag right there. Uh, you know, are we finally going to get to a point where this trend is, is done though? I don't know. I'm keeping an eye on it, though. I'm kind of sick of talking about them, but I think it's important nonetheless. Yeah. One of the ways, and, and this would be something that I'd ask to the group, and again, if we don't get any answers today, I think we touch base on it next week, Gunnar, and this one's kind of an audible as well. 
Um, yes, semiconductors are necessary for AI, crypto, all the things. We know that they've already had their run. I think the next thing, and this is not, this isn't a big surprise, but it, the surprise might be the the gravity and the speed of the move is electricity demand. I think, I, and I, I got to figure out where the marginal pieces of that market are, because what if the U.S. in the next you know, months slash 18 months has a hockey stick in electricity demand because of computing power and all these different things. There's not, it's not like you can just, because a lot of people are into the uranium trade, the nuclear trade. You can't just make nuclear overnight, even if you have like right. SMRs and stuff like that, like the small modular reactors, nothing like that. So I think there's going to be a short to medium term trade that is what can support a bump in in electricity demand and maybe that swing swing power like natural gas um yeah uh, Porsche wrote it in natural gas yeah. um here's a ticker that Derek put in there um this is a uh, grid a grid play which is into that's interesting because the charts are already moving in that direction and like you yeah. said like these are problems, and if you talk to somebody that like is like really deeply knowledgeable and stuff like this, like Byron, these are problems that have been brewing, you know, for decades. And yep. you know, we 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 are, we have a gridlock system now where nothing gets built, nothing gets done, and we're going to get to the point where it's like, I mean, how do you even build a power plant these days with all the red tape? I don't think you do, do you? I mean, no. don't. They just we don't close. build power plants anymore. You know, we suck all the we suck all the oil like out of our supply. You know, we don't build power plants anymore. You know, so it's very yeah. interesting to see this. And you know, there's individual grid issues. You know, Texas with its own grid that's all messed up. Um, that we hear about like every winter when the temperatures drop below 30 degrees or whatever happens down there. Um, and then California, of course, is California. Who knows what's even happening out there? Um, but yeah, I think that I think this is like one of those things where it's like there's no way to fix this, you know, without years and years of of, of reinvestment. And so, like, what are the companies that are going to benefit? I think natural gas makes a lot of sense here, you know. Um, yeah. But uh, it's but, basically but yeah. if you get at capacity and you need more, what are the things that fuel yep. that? And then which ones have tradable tickers? Because those are the ones that could exponentially go up in the next. Again, it could be sooner than later if the narrative starts catching on. But you've got like all Sam Altman was on an interview recently and, and it's getting some a lot of talking points, but he's saying, you know, the currency of the future is going to be like he calls it, he's a weirdo. So he's like, it's compute. But like if you say like a normal human, it's like computing power, like right. the ability to compute stuff. But yeah. you can't compute anything if you don't have electricity. Like so, so the yeah. amount of computing power that's needed and the amount of electricity that needs to go under that. And I think with some of these chips that are coming out, I mean, you've just got you've got super need um coming pretty fast and furious in the electricity grid space. So anything that we can get, um, if you guys have any ideas, if you want to throw them in the chat, throw them in the comments. Uh, PWR looks good. I don't know. I'd have to go do some research on it. It's a power grid company, but they're obviously heading in the right direction. They, I mean, look, look at it. Look they at just the keep going in look the right great. direction. Yeah, we're late. We're late to the party on this one, man. Um, I, but yeah, I mean, like themes like this seem to be playing out. It makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and, and I don't know. There's some other tickers being thrown in chat. Oh, here's one right here. And look, I even have one. I guess we've talked about this before. This well, neck ass, right? Just neck ass producer. Yeah, this seems to be breaking out. Um, you know, moving in the right direction right here. So very interesting stuff happening. Um in this in this group and it's definitely worth watching i feel like energy as a whole and the commodity complex as a whole i mean we've we haven't really talked about it that much here because there's nothing much tradable outside the futures market for us but i mean you you guys know about what's happening in cocoa I and mean, look yeah. at that cocoa chart i mean this is outrageous what the the the, the disruption in the cocoa trade uh right now i mean talk about a hockey stick uh this will flame out eventually but look at these prices. I mean, again, inflation trades, softs are moving like this. Um, there's stuff is brewing out there right now. And looking at like natural gas, still near its lows, as someone pointed out in chat right here, pulling up a weekly. Um, you would think this would have some upside room. 
because it, it seems to be tagging these, these lows that have been generational lows across the board. Let's go to a monthly. Yeah, we're just sort of hanging out. Uh, you know, this is the post-COVID run-up right here. But, you know, natty gas is cheap, cheap, cheap. Yeah, and the only thing the only thing that you need, well, and I don't have it, is I know that the U.S. has tons of natural gas. And obviously, natural gas is priced at Henry Hub. And it's all basically stranded, except for the ability that can get LNG exported, which is not a, a, a large percentage. And it, it's hard for that number to grow where they can export more because it's a very... Uh, rigid market but otherwise like yeah you need a narrative that's like this gas that is stuck here that's basically getting to the point where it's super cheap and free mm -hmm. is going to start going into the electric grid and that's going to double prices or something i don't know i got to dig into it and see see what that would be before i would go long on a, a ung trade or or nat gas in itself because there's a reason it's low we have tons of it and it's stuck here right. so um I mean, it's it's this is a potential reversal in the making, I'm sure. Like, I mean, again, I'm not predicting anything, but just looking at a chart like that, um, you know, this 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 could have the potential to surprise a lot of people. And you just want to keep that in the back of your mind, you know, as things begin to develop. Um, in and maybe the there's maybe there's companies out there that are ready to do this. I know that I'm gonna don't hold me to this story being 100 percent correct, but I know that there were Bitcoin miners back in. You know, the hate like 2021 when when Bitcoin started going up again, the Bitcoin miners were going up. They were they were moving processing, you know, Bitcoin mining units out to like old coal fired power plants. And they were like, turn this thing on, like give us that extra energy because we want to plug into this like C container that has a billion NVIDIA chips in it that are going to make crypto. Things like that going into, uh, you know, a, a, a stretch on energy like. Are there places in the south, north, you know, uh, southeast, somewhere around there, where you've got tons of natural gas, and you can get a, a power plant that's not at capacity? Then all of a sudden they truck in a bunch of data center slash crypto miners slash whatevers. I don't know. There's all kinds of weird stuff that could happen, but that could put a put some support under the price of that gas too. Um, a lot of stuff happening. Yeah. Um, Gunner, I don't know if you want to cover it. We I saw a couple uh, tickers in there. One is our friend DJT. What what's the ticker? I'm sorry. DJT. Oh. <laughs> Here we go, oh, baby. Gosh. Here we go, baby. This is the Trump SPAC. It used to be Trump formally Digital World Acquisition Corp, DWAC. They have yeah. changed tickers straight up to Donald Trump's initials. That's when you know it's getting real. DJT. Uh, this was, I think, and I wasn't, <clears throat> I wasn't paying that close of attention this morning. I saw the news about it and all the, the the changeover and everything, but I believe it was halted at some point right here, and it's still up twenty seven percent. I mean, pretty darn impressive, um, uh, a move uh, so far this year. I don't know if a move like this is going to stick. Um, you know, this is one of those things where like. This could be a one day huge pop with everybody in the news sort of pushing people into this. Um, but I mean, it's definitely quite the breakout for now. It is, it has faded from those highs. It was up closer to 80 bucks and it's now down to 64 bucks. This is some incredible intraday volatility. These are kind of dangerous to play. And oh, yeah. the reason that I say that isn't political at all. I'm I'm gonna go totally politically agnostic here. I know it's not as fun, but if we if we just look at a chart like this. And we know that there's a huge news event and a lot of hype surrounding uh, a play like this. Then you know you 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 nail down the one minute chart and you can see how crazy it can get. Um, and this is going to be, uh, I guess this was what this was like. This was late yesterday and then into today, uh, right here, and you can see how it's kind of losing ground a little bit just a huge move up here um, towards 78 and then it's losing it and there's just a lot of bumpy ground right here and now look we have what looked like a big huge volume spike and this is again this is one minute chart so you kind of got to take it with a grain of salt it's going to be crazy but you can see this big volume spike i'll back up so we can see it a little better look all these buyers right here just crowded into this thing um, at the open and then we can see rolling over 
we can see rolling over right here and then huge selling coming in right there. They're buying it up again, but you can see the big red bar uh, right there. I mean, this to me, this this looks kind of dangerous as in like it could very quickly close the gap if uh, if you're in a situation where everybody wants out all at once. And so that's my main caution with stuff like this. That's like, you know, it, I, I put this in the same category as like a, like a meme stock, uh, a yeah, Sean uh, just wrote that right in there. Yeah. You know, something like that. Matt, you're not on mute. Um, no, I said Sean. Sean put Sean C put it in the chat that that's a meme. It's like a meme stock. Oh, I thought you were talking to somebody. Yeah, yeah, it is like yeah. a meme stock. Did he put it? Yeah, exactly. It's a meme stock. That that's that's like what I'm getting at right here. So that's I think that's a great description of it. A buyer beware. For stuff like this, it's going to be crazy. I mean, if you want to trade it for fun or day trade it, I don't know. Just keep your position small, something like that, because I don't know if it can sustain, uh, if it can sustain a, a move, a move like this. It's it, it is kind of funny though. <laughs> so I'll leave it at that. Crazy. All right. Well, we're getting a little bit to the end here. Any other topics that uh, week over week that you're interested in? I mean, we hit some bangers and we're starting to see a lot of froth come into the market. So there's there's a lot of upside here in the sectors that we were talking about earlier. Um, anything else or any last words? Yeah. I mean, John just mentioned AI in the chat. I think um, I'm, I'm interested to see what the growth stuff can do. Like AI, the stock, um, you know, it's it's had these moments where it's like kind of popped and then like it's just sort of bled it off over the past few weeks. I thought it was really going to get moving here at the end of February, and it's and it's sagged. Uh, this is a tough stock to really nail down. That's why we're really not trying to trade options on it. We just have like a little let it ride position with shares um, in the chat. Stuff like this and PLTR, yeah, that's another one. I've been watching it. Um, it looks like it's breaking out today. Like I kind of like, and if we can kind of let's let's take this line and sort of transpose it to like maybe think about it like this, where like it was coming out of whatever this consolidation was right here. And uh, now it's been a little sloppy, but it is trying to move higher. Uh, I like that it's back above here. Maybe maybe 27 is the next point that we kind of like look at this thing and say like, okay, maybe it can get over the hump, but I don't hate it here. This actually wouldn't yeah. be a terrible trade. Yeah, I'm holding just over. shares of PLTR. Yeah. I mean, I yeah, like it. That's it's not still... bad. And maybe, maybe some calls look good. I don't know, but this is something that's worth this is something that's worth paying attention to. I like it crossing back over this level. I think that it's kind of a no-brainer that it goes to 27 and moves from here. So that's something interesting uh, to keep in mind. And like, you know, again, like that is a nice earnings runner. Yeah, there's been some volatility recently, but it feels like it's time to get back on the train. The growth stocks have been a little wonky. Um, that's just how it's been lately. We've had like, it feels like the market has given us these trade-offs where it's like mag seven up, growth stocks down, growth stocks up. Mag seven down, just depending upon what day of the week it is, the market rolls the dice and that's what you get. So, um, I mean, if you look at like something like Arc, which I kind of use as my growth stock, like appetite proxy, you can see how choppy it's been and how it's traded off between like, oh, looking like the hot garbage and then looking great and then looking like hot garbage again. So I feel like we're setting up for higher prices here. This feels bullish to me and it feels like this could start moving higher. It's just a matter of how many more fake outs are we going to get before it actually goes. My theory, and this is something we've been talking about for weeks now, is that we finally get some bleed lower on the mag sevens that are still up. It's more like the mag four now. But if we still get some bleed lower from the mega caps and then the videos of the world, uh, will the hot money rotate into these um, into these stocks? I know we had a square trade recently that we got out of and we did really well on. You can see how that's starting to build again. I think this is a good growth stock. I, I still own shares of this in a longer term account. Um, but I don't have any options on it right now. But you can see how it's beginning to build, and it looks like it's holding that breakout. It's been choppy as hell, you know. We got out right here, luckily, before this big red day. The next day, nice you trade. Can see, uh, you you can see how this moves, uh, right here, and it, it's looking like it's setting back up again and wants to run. Uh, and again, if you pull back even farther, you can see these levels, and you can see how terrible it looked just a few months ago before the melt up started. So, um. I am keeping these like on the back burner as we try to play things like energy, gold, and crypto this week. And then once some once some spots open up and we start to see some breakouts in this space, heck yeah, I'm gonna try to move into, you know, stocks like this that are, you know, that are posting these really good moves and trying to break out again into the summer. Awesome. All right. Well, we're at time. We appreciate everyone's feedback in the comments and the chat. If you've got anything else, we'll be back next week. 
um, do it in the chat for the trading desk. We appreciate um, Gunnar. I know you have a lot new a lot of new folks that are hanging out in the morning chats, and we appreciate your morning rundown every day and your paid product um, and everything that's going on there. So if you're not a part of the trading desk and you're seeing this call, um, maybe I'll, we'll do something next week where we can get a link out to people or otherwise keep an eye out. We'll see if we can send one somewhere around. Go from there. But thanks for all the updates. Markets melting up. Crypto, gold, energy. Let's roll. CL CLSK is rolling now. Tagging 24. So we'll see how it goes. There we go. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time.